we're looking at transport protocols now. So the, the second to top layer. <clears throat> and we introduced very briefly, well, we, we mentioned that there are two main transport protocols, TCP and UDP. TCP is the, they can come in for sure, more than welcome. TCP is used the most in the internet today. And in fact, in this course, we'll just focus on, on TCP. There are others. And we introduced the concept that we now have a new type of an address, a port number. A port number identifies, think of applications, or more specifically, um, connections created by individual applications. So IP addresses identify devices on the internet, but on those devices, we may run many applications at the same time. So we need a way to identify them, and we can use port numbers for that. Most internet applications, we communicate between software on different computers, <coughs> are structured using a client-server model. That is, we can think of one application as the client, and the other as a server where the simplest differences between the client and the server is that the client initiates the communication. Okay, so there's an application running on my computer, an application on some other computer. One of them initiates the communications, the client in this case. It sends a message to the server application. What does a server do? Nothing until a client contacts it. So the server just sits there normally and waits for a client to initiate the communications. <clears throat> and once the client contacts the server by sending a, a packet, the server may respond and then they'll use some protocol to communicate. And generally they can communicate in both directions. That is, client can send data to server and server can send data back to client. So we often distinguish the client and server based on who initiates the communications. The client does. An example, your web browser, we think of as a, as a client, and a web server, a piece of software running on some other computer, is the server application. The server just sits there, waiting for clients to contact it. So when you open your browser and type in a, a URL and press enter, that triggers the client application to contact the server and to exchange the data in the case of a web browser to web server, to request a web page and send back that web page. <clears throat> now, for this to work, since the client initiates the communications, the client must know the address of the server that it's wanting to contact. First, it needs to know the IP address of the server computer. So the server computer is somewhere on the internet, to know which one to contact, we need to know the IP address of that server computer. Assuming we know its IP address, then there's more things that we need to know. And we'll introduce a new address. We've, we've mentioned it before, but a new one is called a protocol number. <clears throat> the protocol number indicates the transport protocol being used for this data exchange. So each transport protocol has a number associated with it. TCP has number 6, always. UDP, 17. Others, ICMP is 1 and there are others. Okay, I'll show you a list later. Protocol numbers identify the transport protocol being used. And in fact, both endpoints, both applications, you will use the same transport protocol to exchange that data. So if I choose to use TCP, then it means the protocol number is 6. We'll see where it's sent and communicated to the other side shortly. And then we've got a port number, which identifies the application on the other computer that we want to contact. And we saw, and that's what we introduced the, the previous lecture, for example, port number 80 identifies the web server application that we want to contact. So in fact, we have three addresses coming into play here. 
the IP address, think of that as the address of the device. The protocol number is the address of the transport protocol being used, the number for the transport protocol. And a port number is the address of the application on that computer that we're communicating with. Let's see an example in how that's, that's used. <clears throat> so here's an example of two computers on the internet, some source host and some destination host, somewhere on the internet. We'll assume that they have some IP address. Okay? They both have IP addresses. And those computers are using the internet protocol at the network layer. They implement different transport protocols, focus on TCP and UDP, but there may be others implemented. And they may be running different applications at some point in time. So this actually it's a bit of an old example, but on the source host it's running a web browser, some instant messaging client, some Microsoft chat program, some voice over IP application to make a voice call over the internet. And the destination host is running a web server, some instant messaging client, and also a voice over IP. So imagine we're chatting, chatting with uh, sending instant messages between these two computers, and at the same time making a voice call between these two computers, and at the same time you have your web browser open accessing the server on that computer three different applications being used at the same time between these two hosts. <clears throat> Let's look at that from the perspective of sending a packet from the source host to the destination host. So imagine that now we'll look at details of the, the IP datagram sent across the internet to this destination. And I've drawn it, okay, there's some data and if we're looking at, say, the web browsing data, we're using TCP as the transport protocol, so there's a TCP header, and we're using IP as the, the network layer protocol, so there's an IP header, and there may be other headers, but let's just focus on that. This datagram is sent from the source host across the internet to the destination host. Well, how do we make? Well, how does the Internet Cloud here make sure that this datagram gets to this destination host? Inside the IP header, there's a source and destination address, IP addresses. And just a reminder, this is the IP header from one of our earlier slides. The important parts, initially, the source IP address and destination IP address. They are included in the header of the datagram. Destination IP address should be the IP address of this destination host. Let's give it a value. Uh, just to keep it simple. Let's say our source host has IP address 1.1 dot one dot one and the destination host is two dot two dot two dot two so they're the IP addresses of those computers in the internet so this IP datagram inside the IP header those two fields the source IP address and destination IP address will be set to their respective values so inside the header, I'll try and draw that okay, we have a, a source address. It's coming from 1.1.1.1 and destination. So how do our routers in the internet know to deliver this IP datagram to this particular host? Based upon the destination IP address. And the routers will use the IP to deliver that to that specific host. 
Okay, so that's our normal IP forwarding. So let's assume that this datagram gets to the destination host. Now the question is, all right, the datagram arrives at the destination host because the destination address matches the IP address of this host. It gets here, it's processed, it gets to IP, it's delivered to the IP software in that destination host. Now that IP software has this datagram, which transport protocol do we deliver the, that contents of that IP datagram to? So there are, in this case, I've drawn three, trans, three potential transport protocols, TCP, UDP, ICMP. So the IP software receives this datagram, and now it needs to deliver that data to one of those three transport protocols. Which one does it deliver to and why? <clears throat> we don't know. Let's ignore that. Let, uh, the computer and the IP software that just received this datagram doesn't know what application the source used. It's just received the datagram. What could we use to identify? Uh, okay, stop there. In the header, where? There's another field. What is that field? Protocol number field. So in the IP header, when we created that datagram at the source, we set the source IP address to 1.1.1.1, set the destination IP address, and this protocol field in here is set to the value indicating which transport protocol is being used. And if we're using TCP as the example, the value is 6. So we'll write that as well, the protocol number. And it's set in the header of the IP datagram. Because it's defined in some standard somewhere that says TCP is protocol number 6. So yes, it's set in the header of the IP datagram so that when the IP software receives this datagram, okay, it's destined to me, good. The protocol number is 6, therefore I will deliver the contents, that is this portion, to the TCP component of the computer. So we can think that that datagram is received and delivered to IP And then IP looks at the datagram, in particular looks at the protocol number in the field, sees the value is 6. Uh, I know that 6 means TCP, therefore deliver that contents to TCP. As opposed to sending it to UDP, ICMP or some other protocol. So the protocol number is important here, identifies the transport protocol to use. Now TCP receives the data receives this portion. And we haven't covered TCP yet, but we'll see the structure of that TCP header in a moment. TCP receives the data, does some processing, and now TCP needs to decide which application do I send it to on this computer? Do I send it to the web server or this instant messaging software? What do we use to know which application to send it to? The port numbers. The port numbers identify their applications. <coughs> and we'll come to this later. So that was the IP header. The three address values which are important are the source IP, destination IP, and the protocol number. The TCP header we'll cover in detail later, but it looks like this. And note the first two fields. Source port, destination port. Inside the TCP header are those two values of the port number of the application that it came from, 
and the port number of the application it's going to. So those two fields are set, which tells TCP where to send it. So let's give them some values. Let's say that the port number, make up some values, 40123. And what's the port number used by web servers? 80 is the default port number. By web browsers, normally it's a dynamic port, it changes. What's the port number used by Microsoft uh, notification protocol, the Microsoft Messenger program? Anyone know? It does, but it's changed over time. And you, you, I had to look it up, so you don't remember these values. I looked it up, and I think it's, or at least in the past, it was 1863. The value, again, yeah, I don't expect you to remember that, but the point is that these two applications would be using different values, different port numbers. So, in the IP datagram, we contained a TCP segment, and in, in the TCP header, there was a source port and a destination port. And let's say this packet belonged to our web browsing session. So the values the source port came from our web browser 40123 with the value I assign, assign and the destination port when my computer created this packet <coughs> the values it set to the header field source port and destination port are the 40123 and destination web server Port number 80. So these values were set by the source computer when it created this datagram. Of course, there are other values in the headers, but these are the addressing values which are important. So that when computer 2.2.2 .2 receives this datagram, it looks, okay, destination is me, okay, I'll take the data. I need to send it to TCP because the protocol number is 6, and TCP corresponds to protocol number 6. So I deliver that data up to TCP, and TCP looks at the destination port number. This, the data inside this TCP segment must go to the application identified by port number 80, which is our web server. So TCP has different applications it could potentially send to. The port number identifies which one. And sends it up to the web server. And then the web server pro processes the data and does what it needs to do, depending upon that, uh, that data received. So we're just seeing how the addressing is used. Now we have really three types of addresses. IP addresses that identify devices on the internet. Protocol numbers that identify transport protocols. And note that at both endpoints, we use the same transport protocol. So there's only there's no source protocol number, destination protocol number. There's just one value because the source and the destination use the same transport protocol. They must. So we have protocol number six, meaning TCP. And then we have a port number that identifies the application or a part of that application uh, on the particular host. So the source port identifies the connection from the web browser, and the destination port identified the web server in this case. It turns out your web browser can create multiple connections, so it may have multiple port numbers. There's not just one port number for every web browser. It's a bit more complex. IP addresses, protocol number, 
port numbers. Uh, the three main types of addresses that we use in the internet to identify our data communications. <coughs> Web server received this data. All right, where did, well, let's go back. The source host created this packet and set these values. So the source host, when it wanted to send data, it set these values. Okay, how did it know which values to use? We'll start with the simple ones. The source host knows its own IP address, so we can set the source IP address here. Okay. My computer knows its IP address is 1.1.1. .1 .1. One more, dot one. I always forget. And sets the value in the source IP address in the IP header field. We've assumed that the source host knows the IP address of the computer it wants to contact. Okay. And we saw uh, uh, that, well, in practice, normally the end user, the human user, doesn't remember an IP address. They remember some domain name, like ICT.SIT, so on. There's another protocol that will map that domain name to a destination IP address. <coughs> so. You either know the IP address, that is, I remember that the IP address of uh, my computer is, ten, or some computer is 10.10.100.184, or more conveniently, I remember a domain name, and that domain name maps to an IP address. So if we know who we want to contact, then that gives us the destination IP address. Different applications use different transport protocols. So my web browser application uses TCP. So when my software creates this datagram, it knows it's using TCP, so set the protocol number to 6. So that can be set, those three values. <coughs> Where do the port numbers come from? When my web browser starts and wants to connect to a server, the operating system assigns it a port number. It's usually assigned from a, a range of possible port numbers. For example, in my case, the operating system assigned my web browser port number 40123 for this connection. And since it's a web browser, by default it will assume that it's contacting a web server and web servers use port number 80, so therefore sets the destination port to 80. The human user of the web browser may change those values, that you don't have to always contact port 80. In some cases, web servers use different port numbers. Uh, we'll see an example later of, of maybe you could use a, a different, specify a different port number. We'll see when we look at addressing later. Now, the source host creates this packet sets these values, it's sent across the internet, it gets to the destination, it gets to the web server. The web server wants to send a reply. That's normal when we're communicating, we want to exchange data in both directions, we want to send a reply. Where do we send the reply to? Well, we make use of the source values. When the server sends a reply, the destination IP address will now be the, will be the source IP address of the packet received. The reply will be destined to 1.1.1.1. The source will be 2.2.2.2. So we just swap them to send the reply. And same with the port numbers. The web server, source port 80, sending to the web browser destination port 40123. And the protocol number will be the same, 6 again. In the reply. So, for this to work, the source computer must know the port number of the server and the IP address of the server. Usually the protocol number comes from the application being used. They use uh, defined protocols, TCP or UDP. That's why we use common port numbers for common server applications, what are known as well-known ports or even registered ports. Port number 80, always for web servers. 
Port number 443, always for secure web service, HTTPS and others. So that the client can assume that that's the destination port number. The user doesn't have to specify that. The user just needs to specify the IP address, or more conveniently, the domain name, which is mapped to an IP address. Any questions on how these addresses are used, combining transport and, and network layer protocols? The evaluation was done this morning, which means we can have another quiz at the end of this lecture on transport protocol addresses, and maybe another quiz next week. Okay, so be prepared for some quizzes in class. And I can make them as hard as I like because the evaluation's done. This concept of running multiple applications, or even multiple transport protocols inside the one host and using the addresses to identify them is sometimes referred to as multiplexing. So going back to our slides, I don't know if I called it, but sometimes this multiple applications, multiple transport protocols, multiplexing is another name. <coughs> Uh, so, protocol numbers are defined for different transport protocols. There's a, a, a standard that defines and lists them. Port numbers, 16-bit values up to s around 65,000, are split into ranges. There are what's called well-known ports, which uh, have been around for a long time, used for very common servers, 0 up to 1,023. Then, registered ports which are usually also used for servers, but newer ones are maybe not so common. And then the remaining ports, 49,152 up, are usually used by clients. We call them dynamic or private ports. But there may be some difference amongst the split here. Um, <clears throat> you can go to that website and find the list of those protocol numbers and ports. On my computer, I have them listed. Unix computers have them in a file. The file protocols lists the protocol numbers. These are just some of them. ICMP1, TCP6, UDP17, and others. Others that uh, we will not talk about. So, 30 or 40 protocol numbers there, going up to the value 142. <coughs> Then there's a list of the port numbers, or the, the well-known port, or the common port numbers for different servers or services. Some of them you may recognize, some we, we will not. We'll just browse through quickly. Uh, FTP is a protocol used for transferring files. Port number 21. SSH, Secure Shell, is used to log in to other computers, port number 22. Email uses, and I always get these confused, email uses SMTP, port 25. Uh, DNS servers use port 53. Web browsers, web servers, sorry, HTTP, port 80. So this is the definition of which servers use which port numbers? And many others, many I, I don't know. 443 is for secure, <coughs> secure web servers, HTTPS. And there's a whole list. And then we move into the, what's called the registered ports <coughs> above 1023, which again are mainly for servers different servers. And that list goes on and on. Okay. Some other servers, <coughs> if you look in the list, MySQL database servers use 3306. Game servers, 
if you're playing online games, we'll use uh, usually registered port numbers so that you know your cl game client knows which game server to contact. Steam uses 27,000, we're in the range of 27,000 as a port number. So this is common to all transport protocols, port numbers and protocol numbers. Let's introduce TCP. The transmission control protocol. Used in most applications you use on a regular basis. Browsing, email, file sharing, uh, date accessing databases, many uh, applications developed inside companies uh, use TCP, applications that are transferring data files uh, use TCP because it provides reliability. It means when you download something, it's unless it reports an error, you're certain that the data you received is the same as the data that was sent. IP and UDP do not provide that. Some multimedia applications use it. Some make use of UDP. There's a, it, it's not well uh, define which ones they use. <clears throat> what does TCP do? It's what's called a stream-oriented protocol. The idea with TCP is we want to transfer some data from A to B. That data may be coming from the application as multiple different messages. The application wants to send a message to the server, then a little bit later wants to send another message. From TCP's perspective, those messages have no meaning. It just treats them as a stream of bytes, a sequence of bytes. It doesn't treat them as two different messages. And we'll see that when we look at how we use sequence numbers in TCP. It's uh, a little bit different from how we've seen it in other protocols. So we'll come back to see why, what we mean by stream oriented. TCP sets up a connection. Before we transfer data, we, the client contacts the server saying, I want to transfer some data. And the server will respond saying, yes, let's transfer some data. And during that connection setup, they'll negotiate some parameters in preparation for the data transfer. So we say it's connection oriented. We set up a connection and then send the data. When we're finished sending the data, we close that connection. Buffer transfer we will not uh, try to describe now and uh, after we've, we'll come back to it after we've gone through some, some of the other features. Full duplex connection, we set up a connection with TCP. One initiates the connection to the, the destination, but once the connection's set up, we can send data in either direction. Okay. So if the client connects to the server, the client can send data to the server and the server can send data back to the client. It provides error control. We'll see that we send data, we expect acts to come back. And if we don't receive acts, we'll retransmit. It provides flow control. We'll send data, but we're not allowed to send too much such that we'll overflow the receiver. So we've seen those mechanisms. Error control we've seen in ARQ mechanisms. Stop and wait, go back end, selective reject. TCP uses a variation of selective reject. <clears throat> and we've seen flow control in stop and wait flow control and sliding window flow control. And TCP uses sliding window flow control. And the other one is congestion control, which is making sure the sender doesn't send too fast to overflow the routers along the path to avoid congestion in the internet. We haven't seen any features of that or any examples of that yet, and we will not. There's some quite complex algorithms for how that works, uh, but needs another... Uh, entire topic on that. What we're going to focus on for TCP is look at how do we set up a connection and how do we send data and we'll in come back to how that leads to stream oriented data transfer. First the TCP segment, it's called a segment normally. 
TCP packet or segment. And the header normally contains 20 bytes. There's some optional header fields. We'll ignore them. Uh, they, they are used in some features. But to keep it simple, we'll ignore any options. And then data. So this TCP segment is in, put inside an IP datagram. The fields of the TCP segment. We've already mentioned. The source application sets the source port field. And the application we're sending to, the port number of, those of that application is set in the destination port field. For error control, for retransmissions, for flow control, even congestion control, we'll use sequence numbers. So we'll send some data and we'll attach a sequence number to that data. So when we send a TCP segment, we'll include the current sequence number inside the header. It's a 32-bit value. Okay, so we can think, we've seen it again in our protocols, frame number 0, frame number 1, frame number 2, they are the sequence numbers. We use a similar concept in TCP. We will send segments containing data to the destination and the destination can send back acts. And those, those acts include a number, an acknowledgement number saying, thank you for the sequence of data I've just received, the next value in the sequence I expect is this. And that value is included in the acknowledgement number field. We've seen this concept before where we send data with sequence number 0, we send back an ACK saying, thank you, I now expect sequence number 1. We'd say the ACK number is 1. So we include two numbers in the header. They're not always used. Header length. If we have options, the header length may vary. So. Normally it's 20 bytes, but in some cases it may be larger, so we specify how long. Reserved we don't use, or reserved for future use. Flags we'll come back to in a moment on one of the later slides. Advertise window is used for flow control. We'll not explain how it's used, but it's, a, it's used to indicate uh, how much the source is allowed to send so that we don't overflow the receiver. <coughs> There's a checksum. So when the receiver receives the segment, it can check, are there any errors inside this segment? So some error detection scheme. Urgent pointer is used in special cases when we want to indicate that this data has some priority over other data. Okay, to give it some priority uh, options we will not cover, then we include the data. The flags are one-bit values that indicate some feature that is enabled in this segment. And there are a number of different values that can be ta that, uh, they can take. So that lists those header fields. And let's look at the flags. So a flag is a one-bit value. It's either on or off. If the value is bit 1, then we say that flag is on or up, and if it's bit zero, then it's off or false. So there are a range of bits in the header, the flag bits, and each bit has a different meaning. And these, how many do we have? Eight are listed here. Those eight values are the meanings of the eight bits in the flags field. We'll not just explain all of them. What it, they mean is if the value is 1 in that position in the header, it means that feature is on. If it's 0, that feature is off in this segment. There's an ACK flag. What that means is that the TCP segment, there's only one type of segment. But we are going to have to send data and send back ACKs. And the way that it works in TCP is that if we're sending back an acknowledgement, to tell the, the receiver that this is an acknowledgement, we'll set the ACK flag to be on, to be true. If this data, or if this segment is not an ACK, it just contains data, then the ACK flag will be off. Okay, so we actually piggyback the acknowledgements onto the data. 
the other, some we will not see. Uh, we'll see later a sin flag, a fin, and maybe even a, a reset flag. Sin meaning synchronized, which means that if this flag is set, this segment has some special meaning. It's a segment to synchronize the sequence numbers. Let's look at sequence numbers and how we set up a connection in TCP. So the idea now is that we want to send data between our two devices, our two hosts. Using TCP, we set up a connection first. The client contacts the server and says, I want to send some data to you. And the server will respond saying, yes, you can. And they'll negotiate some parameters in doing that. What's the exact exchange for doing this connection setup? We'll see that with TCP. And one thing that they'll negotiate is what sequence numbers to use. So TCP uses 32-bit sequence numbers. They're so used in the error control, flow control, so we need to use sequence numbers. We don't always start at zero with these sequence numbers. So when, actually when we set up a connection, we negotiate between each endpoint what's the initial sequence number to start with. It doesn't have to be zero. If you remember back to some of our slides about flow control and error control, I saw I wrote frame with sequence number zero, frame with sequence number one. So we started at zero always. In TCP for each connection, we normally don't start at zero. We usually start at a value which is greater than what we used in a previous connection. So maybe when I boot my computer up, the first connection it starts at sequence number zero. I transfer some data up until sequence number 100. The next connection I'd start at 101 and keep increasing. So in TCP, because we don't always start at the same sequence number, we need to tell the other side or negotiate with the other side which initial sequence number we want to start with. So the source will choose an initial sequence number and tell the destination, this is the value I want to start with. And because we have a full duplex connection, the destination will also choose its own sequence number, initial sequence number. Uh, what can we do in the last 10 minutes? Let's see how we set up a, a TCP connection. <coughs> Introduce a three-way handshake. So, what we want to do before transferring data is set up a connection, and the way that we do that in TCP, the most common way is this three-way handshake. Three-way meaning we are going to exchange three messages. So, computer A wants to set up a connection to computer B using TCP. Well, to set up a connection, we exchange three messages. A sends a message to B, B replies, and then A sends the third message, the final confirmation. And once we set up a connection, after that we can transfer data between A and B. One purpose of this set setting up a connection, a three-way handshake, is to negotiate or inform the other side of what initial sequence numbers we use. <clears throat> and the way that works is that A will choose an initial sequence number, some value, 100 for example, and send a TCP segment to B including that sequence number. B, if it accepts that, will send back an acknowledgement saying that initial sequence number you chose is acceptable and also B will choose its own initial sequence number, ISN B in this case, and send that back to A and the final message is A saying yes, the sequence number B chose is okay. So they agree upon initial sequence numbers from both sides. Let's see that in a specific example. 
So computer A wants to connect to B. A think of A as the client. It in initiates the communications to the server. The first, or one of the first things it does is it chooses the initial sequence number it wants to use. Let's choose a value, ISN, meaning initial sequence number. For A, let's say it chooses 301. What value will it choose? It will depend upon what's happened in the past. Right? But let's say it chooses 301. The idea is that for the data that it sends, it's going to start from 301 and, and increase from there. It sends a message to B saying, I want to use 301. And inside that message, it sets, we go back to the packet header. So the TCP segment, it sets the sequence number field to the value of the ISN it chose. <coughs> so the sequence number field inside this TCP segment, SN for sequence number, is set to 301. I will not draw the, all the fields, just the important ones for this connection setup. And the other thing that it does in the header is to inform B that this TCP segment is a special TCP segment. It's a segment to synchronize the sequence numbers. And the way that it does that is using one of the flags. The flags, there's one flag called SYN, and you synchronize. When we set this flag to 1, it means the sequence number is one of the initial sequence numbers we've chosen, or is the initial sequence number we chose. It's saying this segment is to, to synchronize our sequence numbers. So we say we set the sin flag on this segment. The other flags are not important or are set to 0. But this first segment, sin flag, is set to, to 1. And the common way that we would draw that on the, the packets is simply note that this segment is a SYN segment. It's a TCP segment, but the meaning is to synchronize sequence numbers. <coughs> B receives this segment. Because the SYN flag is set, it realizes that this is A trying to set up a connection. And note that A chose sequence number 301. Assuming B accepts that, in normal case, we accept that, what B does is it sends back an ACK. And in the response TCP segment, to send back an ACK, I'll say the ACK number where does the ACK number come from? Back to our TCP header. In every TCP segment there are two numbers. We can fill in the sequence number and an ACK number. So in this response segment the ACK number would be set to a number to acknowledgement the initial sequence number received. 302. The way that it works, as we've seen with ACKs all the time, B receives initial sequence number 301. That's okay, I'll send back an ACK with ACK number 302 saying the next value I expect is 302. And to indicate that this TCP segment is an acknowledgement, it would set the ACK flag to be true. Again, another flag in the, in the packet header. We saw there's a SYN flag, there's also an ACK flag. So we say this is an ACK TCP segment. <coughs> These are the values in the header. But also, at the same time, it's common to do it in the same message, B will inform A of its initial sequence number. <coughs> B chooses its own independent sequence number. 
and that's going to be used for the data transfer from B to A. Because we have a full duplex connection, in, we can transfer data in both directions, we'll use a different set of sequence numbers. So B, let's say, chooses the value 46. B wants to start with 46. So in this one TCP segment, it now sets the sequence number to be 46. And it sets the sin flag to be true because this segment is also about B trying to synchronize sequence numbers with A. So just to make it clear, these values are all part of that one segment. Or the header values. These two were in the first segment. <coughs> Not just values in the TCP segment header. A receives this message and A recognizes that B accepted its initial sequence number because the act says it's okay and also recognizes that B has chosen an initial sequence number of 46 and the final step is send back an act acknowledging 46. So it will set the ACK number in the response to 47. Saying, I accept 46, the next one I expect is 47, and set the ACK field or the ACK flag to be true. So those fields are in the, the third segment. When B receives that, B knows that A has accepted the initial sequence number it chose. And they've set up the connection. That's the, the normal way for setting up a TCP connection, this three-way exchange of messages, synchronized sequence numbers. They do other things when they set up the connection, like allocate memory in preparation for the data transfer. But they negotiate the sequence numbers. Then and we'll see this next week, once we start transferring data, we include sequence numbers in the data. What values do we start from? When A sends data to B, it will start with sequence number 302. And when B sends data to A, it will start with sequence number 47. Because the way the acts work. Initial sequence number 301 thinks that's for the first message, the act number 302 says B is now expecting sequence number 302. So the first piece of data sent would contain sequence number 302. And as they send data, those sequence numbers would increase. This is an important part of uh, how TCP works. We'll see it, and you probably saw it in your assignment. Uh, and we'll see it... Uh, in a few examples this semester and, and especially next semester in some labs. So uh, it's an important part and it's necessary in TCP, but we'll see it has some, some overhead. Let's stop there. What we'll do next week to, to cover TCP is look now, how do we transfer data? In particular, how do we use the sequence numbers in the data transfer? And that will cover most of TCP, and then we'll just have one more last example using HTTP. So that will finish the course.